And now that we've had our peace and that we've shared the communion of peace, the most assured and blessed thing that we have and the gift that we can always turn to and remember, peace of Christ. Now let us move forward with our scriptures, which will be read by ruling elder Andrea Bradford. And they are printed in your bulletin as well as she will let you know exactly what they are um, because I'm not going to share the screen at this point in time. So ruling elder Andrea Bradford. Thank you, thank you. I always enjoy this time because it's a time of hearing the reassurance that we get in the word, the preaching of the word, the hearing of the word from the Bible. And we lead ourselves into this prayer and reflection with our prayer of illumination. It says, may these words of wisdom we are about to hear rest in our hearts and be understood in our spirits. Amen. Amen. And our first reading is from 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter, verses 1 through 22. 2 Samuel 6, 1 through 22. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him there because he reached out his hand to the ark, and he died there beside the ark of God. David was angry because the Lord had burst forth with an outburst upon Uzzah, so that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day. He said, how can the ark of the Lord come into my care? Mm. So David was unwilling to take the ark of the Lord into his care in the city of David. Instead, David took it to the house of obed Eam, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of obed Eam, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom, and all his household. Mm -hmm. It was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Mm. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the bird offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. 
David returned to bless his household. But Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants maids as any vulgar fellow might shamelessly uncover himself. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me in place of your father and all his household to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord that I have danced before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this and I will be abased in my own eyes. But by the maids of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. That's right. And from the book of Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 3 through 14. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. Hmm. He destined us for adoption hmm. as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to do the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, hmm. having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Mm. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. And our gospel reading, according to Mark, the gospel of Mark chapter six, verses 14 through 29. Mark six, 14 through 29. King Herod, heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself, had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. Hmm. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Hmm. <laughs> and Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and he liked to listen to him. And an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, 
gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. <laughs> the king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Mm -hmm. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. Hmm. When his disciples heard about it. They came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, thank you, ruling elder Andrea Bradford. That was a lot of scripture with a lot of juicy details in it. Yeah. <laughs> and you read that so beautifully. So I thank you for that as well. And right now, what I want to do is I want to pull in any of the young people that are online with us today. I know we have some of our young people who are down south for a wedding today or who were in a wedding yesterday and that they'll be driving back later today. But I want to share what I did with them over the week which is very briefly something that I think you might sort of be interested in. As you know, this week we've been talking about, as you've heard, we've heard about these people dancing. We've heard about David dancing. We've heard about Herodias dancing, who is actually Salome, who we know as Salome, the one who danced in front of King Herod. Mm -hmm. But it made me think, about music and about dancing and about praising God and using the symbol and the and the tender and the timbrel and all that other stuff that is mentioned in the, in the Bible. Every time we think about praising God and thinking about music. So I asked the young people on Facebook, on our Facebook page for St. James and on my own personal Facebook page, I asked them this question, how does really good music make you feel? How does really good music make you feel? And I know that if Ammon had more and more words to say to us that he would be able to explain because his mother plays the trumpet so beautifully and he's been on her hip going to different gigs back and forth ever since he was in the womb. But how does music, how does really good music make you feel? And here are some of the responses. I won't give the names because we are live on Facebook and I wanna protect the anonymity of our young people as well. But some people said, while I'm listening to music, it's like you're in your own little space, bubble or world, making you ignore whatever is outside of your bubble. Another person said, really good music makes me feel validated. I believe good music is connected to the inner emotions that you are feeling that you can't explain or express. Good music makes me feel less alone in my emotions. When I listen to music, it makes me feel happy, jumpy, and makes me want to walk around. <laughs> you know what David was doing when he was dancing? And another person that I'll share with you said, music and dancing is a connection to community and spirit. Hmm. Sharing the dance floor is a form of worship. Hmm. And that's from a group called the Holy Spirit Dance Club. <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine is in. But what I wanted to share with you about this whole idea is this, this whole thing about music. I may have shared this with you in a sermon before, but I want to refocus it in. There was this wonderful, wonderful music a uh, panel of music musicians from around the world, Tibetan monks who had those really long horns. And someone said something that 
really resonated in my heart. They said, I think when the first people were sitting around the fire and they looked up and saw the heavens and the stars and the moon and the night sky, that they were so amazed that they had no words and no language. All they had to do was create music. Music is an expression of praising what it is that brings us joy and brings us happiness. But also, I don't know if you know this, singing and dancing affects certain parts of the brain. Yes. It affects your brain so that it, it cures depression if you dance hard enough and long enough. <laughs> it makes you well, it lowers your blood pressure. It moves your endorphins to make you feel happiness and joy and content. So I am telling you now, young people, older people who are younger, older people, I'm even saying this to myself. I had to say this to myself when I realized how long had it been since I actually danced around in my apartment. I am telling you to sing. I'm telling you to dance because it's good for you. Yes. Sing, dance because it's good for you. You don't have to have what they call rhythm. <laughs> you don't have to know the latest TikTok dances that you're copying from somebody else. You don't have to know all of that. All you have to do is let the music wash over you and let it make you feel. And sooner or later, you'll start moving. <laughs> and if you start moving long enough, you'll start moving even more. And when you move even more, you find that your feet start moving and then your whole body starts moving. And then all of a sudden you realize that you're dancing. God loves a good dance. And I can say that because David danced. Miriam danced when they got to the other side of the Red Sea. There's dancing all throughout the Psalms. When you find an opportunity, dance. We don't dance enough in our world. We don't let ourselves have that kind of joy enough. But I'm telling you now, God gives you permission <laughs> to have joy. So sing. So dance, it's good for you. Most gracious God, we thank you for even the idea of chair dancing if we can't get up and move. We thank you for the idea of knowing that there were times when we just had to sway because you've been so good to us. There are times when we dance and move just because we think about how good you are to our lives. Your goodness is our music, oh God. So may we never be ashamed of the dance. Mm -hmm. May we never be ashamed of our song. And may we always reach out to you for a new song and a new dance. And maybe, just maybe when we find our new song and our new dance, maybe we'll be the new viral TikTok sensation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. You may build great cathedrals, big and small.
chose that song because it really fits with what made me think about how I entitled this sermon today. The idea of hold this in your mind and when you dance. And when you dance. We have three scriptures today. Our second Samuel text, our Ephesians text, and our Mark text. We, let's start with the Mark and text, first of all. We have this King Herod. And let's be clear, King Herod is not the king of Israel. He's not the king of the Jews. He is appointed by the Roman emperor to be in charge and allowed to call himself king. So just get this. When he says to Salome, oh, I will give you even half of my kingdom, he ain't got no kingdom to give. So let's just remember that nothing belongs to Herod. 
Nothing at all belongs to Herod. He is put in place as a puppet king for Rome. His father before him has been put in place. His family has been put in place. As a matter of fact, his own people can't stand him and don't call him a true Jewish man. <laughs> so what he is doing here, sort of holding court, asking his daughter, his stepdaughter, mind you, to dance in front of a bunch of men is totally inappropriate and totally wrong in the eyes of God and in the eyes of his prophet, John the Baptist. But remember when I told you that we're looking at the book of Mark this month and thinking about how it speaks to colonialism and how it speaks to the revolutionary Jesus. With Rome being colonized, Herod's brother was married to Herodias. But that marriage was a political marriage to keep the peace. So John the Baptist wasn't just also wasn't just talking about the adultery of sleeping with your brother's wife and what all that meant. He was also <laughs> talking about the fact that you have jeopardized your entire people, all the people that you say that you care about, that you're king over, you have jeopardized their very being by ruining the entire relationship that we built with another country who may possibly try and find out how to align themselves with Rome now to destroy us because of your lust. That's what John was talking about as well. So let's not be mistaken about it. So when Salome comes in and dances, there's a famous opera that has the dance of the seven males. Mm -hmm. which we know and we've heard about in our different ways of understanding the story of Salome and John and Herod. But it is this, this frenzied dance that all the men in the court, remember her mother is outside of the room. <laughs> this young girl is in a room with men who are drooling over her as she dances. So she gets them to this frenzy. But remember the thing that she does is she goes to her mother and says, he said he'd give you anything. What would you want? So my question of questions is when you dance, who are you dancing for? You see, Salome was dancing not just for Herod, but also for her mother's satisfaction. So Nothing good can come out of that, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing good can come out of it when you are putting and projecting all of your effort into something that is evil. <laughs> so when you are projecting all of this, this, this way of dancing, this way of being in control, this way of trying to gain power, because let's not be mistaken. We can talk about lust and we can talk about sex all we want to, but this is really about power, which is what sex and lust and all that stuff is really all about. It's about who can dominate, who can be in power, who can be in control. And we're trying to demystify that by talking about what love really is. When we talk about love, we're thinking about the love of Christ. We're thinking about the love that, 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 that kind of love that is the way that God loves us, that we're supposed to love one another. We're not thinking about that Eros kind of love. But Salome and John and Herod, poor John sitting in jail, <laughs> Herod asked her to dance for his own sense of power so that he can please those who are in his court, so that he can boost his ego. This entire scene that is happening in Mark is a way of someone who has no power trying to exert power. That happens in communities and in cultures and in countries. It is certainly what happens when people find themselves in ghettos, right? 
when we think about this phenomena of ghettos and when we say that blacks are killing blacks so uh, what what are we going to worry about you know the police need to arrest them it's the blacks killing blacks anyway it's not the idea that black folk are killing black folk it's that the idea that we are so oppressed and people in ghettos and 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 people in poor living conditions and who have oppression weighed down on them reach out and lash out for power some way shape or form and unfortunately those who don't have take it out on one another now that's the sociological issue about it right but that happens internally in our families as well we hurt the people we love the most because we don't have the power to affect change on the outside of ourselves so it's much easier it's much easier to think that we can hurt the people we care about because they're going to forgive us. But we are called to something more. We're called to something larger. We aren't called to think about the self-interest of what my mom wants from King Herod. We're not, we're not that self-interested to think about, I want John the Baptist's head. What can I get from this situation? What can I get from this dance? If I dance for Herod, when I dance and I'm dancing for Herod, what can I get out of it? That's not what we're called to do. And it's not who we're called to be. So who are we called to be? And how are we called to dance? Well, let's go back to 2 Samuel. David, dancing wildly and uncontrollably as the ark is being led to Jerusalem. David, who has unified the northern and the southern kingdom of Israel, unified the 12 tribes again, that's done well in the eyes of God, is bringing the very presence of God. We like to think that it's just the, the Ten Commandments that are in the, in, the Ark of, in the Ark of the Covenant. But wherever the Ark resides, this is the belief that the presence of God is there. And David is bringing God back to the center of God's own people. That's why he's dancing. He is dancing out of this joy that God is back. Our God is home. And Michal chastises him for the way that he's dancing. Many people think that it's because he wasn't wearing many clothes, but that's not really the issue. The issue is that he is declaring himself king and declaring himself priest. He does a sacrifice and he's making himself go into the household of Saul, of the king. Who is now dead. And in this declaration and celebrating his kingship, he is like a commoner dancing in a club. <laughs> and McCall is saying, How dare you? How dare you disrespect the role of being the king of Israel? But the beauty about it. The beauty about it all is David basically says, I wasn't dancing for you. <laughs> I wasn't dancing for the maidens. I wasn't dancing for the priests. I wasn't dancing for anybody who was carrying the ark. I was dancing for God. So when you dance, dance for God. Dance for the joy that we were talking about to the young people about. The joy of what it means that when you think about what God has done for you, I don't understand sometimes how I can't even sit still sometimes when I think about all that God has done for me. Think about it. You've been able to eat. You've been able to walk. You've been able to talk. You've been able to, even if you're sick, sit up in a hospital bed and breathe in God's good air during this entire pandemic of COVID. And here we are. Here we are today, blessed by God, claiming that God is no longer in the temple, but God is with us. 
And when you have that divine power and presence of God within you, how can you keep still? It doesn't work that way. So David is saying, I am dancing for God, Mikhail. These maidens that you think I embarrass myself in front of, they will know that this is an honor, an honor to dance with God. And that's, so when I dance, that's why I dance. That's for whom I'm dancing. I'm not dancing for anything other than for, for the joy of knowing that God is home and that we have been able to bring God back to where God wants to be in the midst of us. That's why David dances. So why do we dance? Yes, we dance for God, but Ephesians and Paul gives us an even better reason. You see, Paul is talking to the Ephesians about the fact that we Jewish people have this inheritance, but you have been adopted. And adoption is much deeper than it is in our context. When you are adopted and that language is used in the Roman society, it means that you are made equal to a Roman. If you're adopted by a Roman, think of the movie Judah Ben-Hur. When he is adopted by that general, he is afforded full citizenship as a Roman person. Nobody who is not born into Rome is respected as a Roman citizen, except for when you're adopted. So Paul takes this language that Rome is so proud of, and he says, look, it's not about being a Roman citizen. You have been adopted through Christ by God. You have been brought in as an equal heir to God's grace and God's mercy. That's what we celebrate today. We are an equal part. And in the, the near the end of this, this, this chapter of Ephesians that we're reading, this section that we're reading in Ephesians, it says that you have received the inheritance. Do you know what that word means in Greeks? It means you've received your down payment. What God has promised to you, God has given you just a little piece of on this earth so that you can hold on to it and praise and dance and sing and hold on and love and fight for righteousness and justice and truth and what is good. God has already laid it out for you so that this taste of the treasure of what is to come will fuel you on. This taste this foretaste of glory divine that we get to manifest here on this earth right here and now. If that does not make you want to ease on down the road (laughs) to the end of the rainbow, I don't know what will. God has given us an inheritance a down payment of what it means to be adopted into the family of Christ. God has given us a down payment (laughs) so that we have an inkling of the riches of what it means to be in the family of Christ. All your sins all your faults, God covers with grace. All the missteps you've made, all the longings and worries you have, God covers with mercy. You can leave it there. With God, you can't carry a treasure if you're holding your burden. You can't carry your treasure 
if you're holding on to your burden. So let God's grace and mercy be your down payment so that you can put down your old used car and walk into the lot and drive off with your dreams. Mm -hmm. Drive it to God's club <laughs> and get your dance on so that when you dance, you're dancing for the joy of what God has done, is doing, and will do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most gracious and loving God, we come to you now saying hallelujah and thank you for the dance. Thank you for all the reasons you give us to dance, that you are the music in our hearts and in our spirits that make us move from side to side, that make us lift up our hands and clap, that make us sing. We are so grateful to you, oh God, in this moment that you have taken the opportunity to show us what it is like through your servant David at this point in his life to dance unflinchingly in front of the world for you. We are grateful that David teaches us not to be ashamed to dance for you because you're not ashamed of us. <laughs> and that is a joy unspeakable. In a world in which we find ourselves oppressed, in a world in which we find ourselves judged, in a world in which we find ourselves full of discontent, you lift us up and hold us and tell us it's okay to still dance. For you are the Lord of the dance, O oh God. And when we claim you, we claim the righteous inheritance, the down payment that lets us keep on and move on just day after day after day. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our congregational hymn can be found at number 302 in your blue hymnals. It's called I Danced in the Morning. We're going to do verse 1 verse, then the chorus, and then we're going to do verses two, four, two, three, and four chorus, and then five in chorus, but you'll follow along. <laughs> this old shaker melody, yes. Turn black 
It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. They buried my body and they thought I'd gone. But I am the dance and I still go on. So dance then wherever you may be. Cause I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you on in the dance, said he. Well, they cut me down and I leapt up high. I am the delight that will never, never die. I'll live in you and you'll live in me. For I am the Lord of the dance, said he. So dance then wherever you may be. For I am the Lord of the dance, said he. Lead you on wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I love those songs that tell the entire life story of Jesus. <laughs> Just like Amen. We were talking about that earlier. My brothers and my sisters, I realize that in our chat. I have not been able to get to it, so I'm just going to go there for There's a Christ brought, brought you talent, and there's a piece of Christ to all of us from people who are online with us. I'm not going to go. We're not on Facebook, so I'm not there. So. <laughs> but I do also want to say that um, there are prayers that we have on our hearts. There are joys. There are concerns. There are sorrows. And there are some of us who are looking for the strength to dance. Let us bring our petitions to God right now. Because God hears and knows all. And God will do what God said God will do. Which is abide by the plans that God has laid for us. Despite but it is we think we might need. So let us pray to that grace and mercy now. Oh God, we've been lifting up the ideal of wanting to dance, praise you, and sing. But first let us say thank you. Thank you for those moments in our life when we've been caught dancing, caught singing, caught praising, caught being in love with you. Thank you, oh God, for allowing us to know that we can dance because we have danced before. That you have brought us joy and that you have brought us through. So we cannot ask you if we do not thank you. Because when we thank you, we lift up the fact that we have faith in you because we know we've seen it before and you've done it before. So with that strength and that confidence of what you have done and what you are doing for us, we come to you now with our concerns and our thoughts. Asking, oh God, that as we come out of this pandemic and as we sort of work our way to try and get things back, to some semblance of how things need to be, not to get them back, but to be new in you. We ask that all of those who are looking for jobs right now as unemployment runs out, as people are striving to figure out, can they be trusted in a work capacity? Let them find work, oh God. Let them find the opportunity to make a life for themselves so that they can say, I am God's and God is proud of me and I'm proud of God and God and I are going to make this life work together because there are those who have been without oh God and you know who they are you know where they are so we ask that you would support them and that if we in any way shape or form have any ideas about how we may help that you will let us come together and lift up those in our community that need help being lifted up we also know, oh God, that as much as many of our cities and organizations are opening up, the 
there is still a segment in our country that is suffering. People are dying. People are getting sick as we speak. We ask your mercy and your grace. We ask that you will allow your people to discern how to take care of themselves. What is best for their health? What is best for their families? What is best for their communities? And gracious God, we know that there are those who are striving, striving to be different in this world, who have been called here for new life and new opportunity. May we celebrate that, celebrate them, hold them in our community so that they know that they are not alone. Just as Shiloh Presbyterian Church did 200 years ago with those runaway slaves who came up here and needed community and needed family. May we still be that haven. May we still be that place to go because we are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. And there's always room in your pasture for more, oh God. So we thank you for that. God, our young people are about to venture off into the rest of this summer. We ask that you will give them peace and rest, that you will let them enjoy good music and good dance be in touch with their emotions and their sense of self as they grow so that when they get to school in the fall, they will know that you have been working with them all summer and building up their minds and their capacity to take on new learning. May we lift up and learn from our beautiful friend, Zayla avant-garde as she celebrates winning the spelling bee, oh God. May we lift that up as an example of what we can do, not of what our children cannot do, but of what we all can aspire to. We may not all be spelling bee champions, but there is greatness in all of us. And may her win, may that, may that ring in our hearts so that we can find the greatness that we have in ourselves. Your smile, oh God, is so beautiful. So when you smile on us, we thank you because it means that you are giving us your love and that you are always with us. We are never alone. We may feel alone sometimes. We may toss and turn at night. We may not know what is coming next in our lives. But we are grateful that we are with you. Give us the faith and the trust to know that you will work it out that what we don't know is already done by you for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Bless those who are sick and shut in. We ask that you touch Theo, Anthony's son, Theo Bernard, as he was hit by a car on July 4th and he's okay and he's recuperating but help him as he goes through this summer wearing a cast on his ankle we know how uncomfortable that can be and we thank you oh God that it wasn't as bad as it could have been so we give you thanks and we pray for him that you will lay your hands on him God many of us are turning corners in our lives we can't see what is around the bend. Just hold our hand and let us know that we're going in the right direction when the time comes. And as
as we venture into the rest of this summer, oh God, it is the fervent prayer from this community to all who are in the sound of my voice and all who are in the satellites of the people that are under the sound of my voice, that this summer, your people will find an opportunity to do some self-care. That they will take a vacation or sit and relax. That they will grill on a Wednesday night instead of a Saturday. That they will do something that will bring them joy and bring them some sense of peace and knowing that you are calling for us to take care of ourselves. Whether that be kayaking in the Hudson River. Yeah or whether that be mountain climbing here in New York State, or whether that be looking at the verdant hills and pastures of Alabama, oh God. May we take care of ourselves because sometimes we get in your way <laughs> of you trying to take care of us. So be with us as we move into the summer and may this be a summer of self-care so that we can be stronger to do your will and to do your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God has smiled on So now is that time of the day yeah. when I bend down <laughs> and try my best to pull out <laughs> these plates. <laughs> 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 these plates, which are our offering plates, which for those of us who are here will just be left out. But today it is symbolic so that you can see that it's empty. <laughs> And it's asking, I hear it saying, can you dance a little bit inside me? Dance some offerings inside here. You know, in many of our churches, our Ghanaian churches, the offering is such a special time because they don't just give their offering. They dance down the aisle to give their offering unto God with a joyful heart. Today, may you think about how God has blessed you, and may you help us to do the ministry that we are doing. If you've been ministered to, let your ministry be represented in our offering so that you can minister to someone else. And we are grateful for all that you're doing. We're grateful for all of you that are giving regularly on PayPal online grateful for all of you that are mailing in your offerings in our new secure mailbox, mailbox as well. <laughs> mailbox. So we are grateful for all of you and we thank you. And for this we say we'll just leave these here symbolically because that's what God calls us to do. And we will say thank you, oh God. May we finally be back together soon when we will be dancing our offering down the aisle because you are so good to us. Bless all that is given today, all that comes in, all that works towards the maintenance of this ministry so that we may do what you are calling us to do in the world. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's funny, I um, have a friend of mine did a presentation on fundraising in churches of color. And this wonderful woman was talking about how she was building, this minister was talking about how she was trying to acquire a new building for her congregation. But she never had offering plates. She left the offering plate on the back table. 
And within a year, she had all the money that she needed. Huh. It's faith. It is hearing what God is calling for us to do. And so when she left that there in faith, she was amazed when she told the story. And that's how they did their fundraising. But it's the same thing that comes from our hearts. We don't need to have people see what we do, right? Mm -mm. We just need to do. Just do it. So that's why we do online and we mail in. And we're just grateful. So let us continue to give with a grateful heart. And I don't know about you, but here we are now near the end of our service. We've sung, I danced in the morning a shake or two. We've done that old Mahalia Jackson tune, only what you do for Christ will last. We've done a bunch of stuff. But this one, we all know and we love. It goes like this. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its words. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. We sing, oh, how I love Jesus. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. And it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. We sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, and it tells me what my father had in store for every day. And though I tread a gloomy path, he'll sunshine all the way. I sing, oh, how I love Jesus, and oh, how I love Jesus, oh. Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. I sing, oh, how I love Jesus, and oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. So when you dance, don't worry about who's watching. Don't worry about who's listening. Know that when you dance, God smiles says thank you because I am with you always even until the end of the earth and go out into this world and let somebody know that if you feel someone's making you dance for a reason that doesn't bring you joy that they can turn around and dance for God oh